Thesis up front, the art of D&D has changed over the years, and it's changed along with the game. Early D&D was pulp fantasy survival horror, and its audience was primarily adults. Modern D&D is more of a Marvel superheroes type of fantasy game, and the audience, in my opinion, skews much younger. We take a look at how the art and the game of D&D has evolved today on Dungeon Crack. Deathbringer here. Subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out on any cool content. This is Art and Arcana, a visual history of Dungeons and Dragons. It is my favorite Wizards of the Coast product. Highly recommend it. It is expensive and quite heavy, and you can see by the post-its I really enjoy reading this book over and over again. And as I was reading it, I was struck by how the art of D&D has evolved over the years to reflect the game itself. This is an original D&D supplement called Eldritch Wizardry, a picture you would never see on a D&D product today. It features a prone woman. She's about to be sacrificed on an altar. It shows you the intended audience was not children. The use of the word eldritch is very pulpy and only understood by adults. I mean, if you were marketing a game toward kids, you would never use it. Which reminds me, I have a game called The Eldritch Hack, which is my rules like Cthulhu game, available at drive through RPG. It really looks like it could be a cover of a 1930s issue of Weird Tales. It actually does resemble this 1936 issue of Weird Tales. Notice the featured story is the Conan tale Red Nails, one of the best and required reading, I think, for all Dungeon Masters. This is the fantasy from which D&D sprang, Pulp Stories, by Howard Lovecraft and Tolkien. The magic system was cribbed from Jack Vance's Dying Earth, the alignment system from Moorcock's Elric Saga, the Thieves' Guild from Fritz Leiber's Farford and the Grey Mauser stories, giant snakes and spiders from Howard's Conan tales. These stories were dark and brutal, and early D&D art shows characters getting crushed by monsters, devoured by giant spiders, getting their brains sucked out, rot grubs burrowing into the skin, expressions of terror, and heroes cut down in their prime. But nothing compares to the darkness of the fiend folio with characters being disemboweled and strangled to death. Can you imagine seeing this in a 5e book? But back in the 70s and early 80s, this is what playing D&D was like. When you entered a dungeon, death lurked around every corner. This is the cover of the 1978 Player's Handbook by Dave Trampier, the Sistine Chapel of D&D art. The characters look like Jethro Tull, bearded 70s dudes. The party is large, seven characters plus henchmen, and they're performing seemingly mundane tasks, cleaning a sword, removing gems from a statue's eyes, studying a map, henchmen carrying out the loot, guarding the door. These are working class heroes doing a job. The art stresses the features of 70s D&D, mapping, planning, preparation, and caution. Notice all the characters are human. Elves and dwarves had strict level limitations, resulting in a human-centric world. Parties were larger because characters were less powerful. They only had a handful of hit points. And the characters on the cover of the 1981 Moldvay basic set look positively scrawny. And no wonder. They rolled 3d6 for ability scores and didn't get a bonus unless they had a 13 or better. Notice the wizard looks surprised and has her foot turned away from the dragon in case she needs to retreat. Balanced encounters were not a thing back then, and running away was often the best option. The early 80s saw D&D getting a facelift. Part of it was a reaction to the satanic panic. D&D had moved from conventions to colleges to high schools and then to elementary schools where I and the cast of Stranger Things discovered it. And as D&D's audience got younger, Morley the Friendly Wizard appeared in advertising, assuring parents that D&D was a harmless and wholesome pastime. The game's financial success allowed TSR to hire professional artists like Larry Elmore, Jeff Easley, Keith Parkinson, and Clyde Caldwell. The art of Dragonlance and the covers of Dragon Magazine evoke the epic fantasy of Tolkien, Anne McCaffrey, and Terry Brooks. The brothers Hildebrandt, who illustrated those books, also illustrated D&D calendars. Together, these artists define the look of D&D in the 80s. By this time, original D&D designer Gary Gygax was gone from TSR, and new CEO Lorraine Williams ordered a new second edition devoid of demons, devils, assassins, and thieves threatening to slit the throats of merchants in dark alleys. 
There were still moments of darkness, like Clyde Caldwell's Hammer Horror-inspired Ravenloft art and Brahms' Dark Sun illustrations, modeled on Frank Frazetta's Conan art. This was a world that was all pecs and quads, and all the rations seemed to be keto-based, and it's still some of my favorite D&D art. The Art of Third Edition had a Da Vinci-inspired look in parchment-style pages, which I thought looked retro and cool. The fourth edition took cues from World of Warcraft, ushering in an era of giant weapons and huge pauldrons. D&D mechanics changed too, incorporating video game elements like healing surges into the Matrix. But there was another, even bigger fantasy tsunami building. The early 2000s saw the release of the Lord of the Rings films, the Harry Potter films, and the birth of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. D&D players born in the year 2000 grew up reading and watching Harry Potter, Percy Jackson, and the Avengers. Wizards and superheroes supplanted Conan and Farvard and the Grim Mauser as the fantasy archetypes. And 5e D&D was designed to meet the expectations of this new audience. Characters have higher ability scores, more bonuses, more hit points, and death saves to keep them alive. 10 out of the 13 classes have some sort of spellcasting ability. These are not just heroes, they're superheroes, able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with monsters 10 times their size. This Tempest Cleric looks like the Mighty Thor. Protection spells are glowing circles like in Doctor Strange. Characters always look badass and never show fear, probably because they have 160 hit points. They're always depicted as confident, powerful, dominant, but never as victims. If you get killed by some random wandering monster, it kind of undermines the narrative. Your character is the hero the world has been waiting for. And Brom has been replaced by Prom. The art of Wild Beyond the Witchlight in Strixhaven is more Harry Potterish, more whimsical. There are owls and bunnies and thundercats and teenage mutant ninja turtles and other anthropomorphic species designed to appeal to a younger audience, one more familiar with red wall than red nails. Recent releases present a kinder, gentler D&D. There's a lot more singing and dancing. Welcome to YA D&D. Over the past few decades, young adult fantasy has exploded in popularity, and this is the audience Hasbro is trying to capture. Dark and gory art can still be found, but it won't be found in mainstream D&D products. You'll find it in third-party RPGs like Merc Bori, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and Dungeon Crawl Classics. Games aimed at adults who still remember Appendix N and sticking their head in the green devil face and not getting a saving throw. I've heard 5e described as heroic fantasy, but I think it would be more accurate to characterize it as superhero fantasy. Characters start out powerful and quickly become even more awesome. Combat is less about survival and more about showcasing fantastic moves and abilities. Death is rare and victory all but assured. And lots of people seem to enjoy playing this way. If that's you, cool. Play the game you want. There's no wrong way to play D&D, but I prefer a game that's a little more Conan and less Kung Fu Panda. I miss that pulp fantasy vibe when danger lurked around every corner. Death was only one missed saving throw away, and victory was far from guaranteed. But that's what I think. I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. Also below are links to DungeonCraft on Facebook, Patreon, and DriveThruRPG, where you can get Deathbringer, my house rules. But don't go away, there's more content over here, and as always, may all your rolls be 20s. So Deathbringer, to capture the younger demographic, I was thinking maybe we could make the outros a little more festive, you know, have some song and dance numbers. Listen and listen well. Deathbringer does not dance. For more badass D&D, get my Deathbringer rules at drive-thru and my t-shirt below, and watch more Dungeon Craft.